Hello, everyone. So let me start by sharing my screen. Just give me one second here. It's amazing. Yeah. Tom Gibson and I are all in the same room. All in the same room, yes. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Gibson Kirsting. I work for RWE in Austin, Texas. I've been uh, working with a data schema now for over a year as well with uh, the, the, the core team uh, that uh, has presented already and many other folks as well. Uh, as well, uh, I've been working recently with my colleague Nico, who is in the call, also from RWE, and we've been contributing to the schema. And uh, I'm also involved in IEC-12-15 as well. And so I, I try to bring some of the perspective from the IC into the, the data schema as much as I can. So, um, and uh, we'd like to share today with you our experience with the implementation of the, 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 the data model. So let's start. My presentation is very short and maybe it's going to be mostly questions, but the agenda is that why? Why RWE decided to contribute and also adopt the IA Task 43 data model, uh, RWE's experience in implementing the data model, and then finally uh, the IA Task 43 data model implementers who are them. So the first, uh, the the first uh, thing is efficiency. I mean, we went towards efficiency. Uh, the first uh, big topic is related to data exchange, which Amit has touched on that topic recently. So as a owner operator and a developer, we do a lot of uh, data transition between uh, uh, OEMs and between consultants. And every time that the data needs to go, go out, uh, it takes a lot of time. So we need to capture all the documentation, the PDF documents that the MIT was talking about, pictures and so on, package them all, We've already checked them for our internal analysis. You know, someone went through, there was a peer reviewer as well. And when I send to a consultant, they have to do exactly the same job. They have to unpack the files, review them. They have to peer review to make sure that it is going to go fine into the report. And the same thing for the turbine manufacturer. So the pain that we suffer, that pain, we are like propagating to the rest of the industry every time that the data goes out of RWE. So we decided that, okay, this is a great way that we can exchange data between organizations. Also, as a developer, we, we buy and we sell projects. And when we buy projects, sometimes comes like a, a folder with scrambled data. It is like, good luck, take care of it. And uh, it takes a lot of time if you're doing an analysis to unpack that data. So we believe that this uh, facilitates the, the data exchange. Uh, the other piece, the other path that we see on the efficiency side is that this I see or we see as a foundation of automating the metadata and the time series application. So if you wanna do any sort of automation, uh, we have a, a bunch of like really qualified people in the resource assessment community with a PhD, masters, and if you are spending most of your time typing calibrations and making sure that those numbers are correct, or spending a lot of time assembling your data and not taking much time in looking in your CFD results, uh, then we have a problem, right? So I think that we want to eliminate that problem by some sort of uh, automation on both sides. And that's uh, the reason why we chose. So those are the two main areas that we uh, believe in. That's why we're implementing the data model is uh, to gain efficiency on those two parts. Within this uh, frame of uh, automating the metadata and the time series, I think that it's uh, Amit has already talked about, but it's much easier to accomplish this task with a team of experts. We worked together every week virtually for over a year. And I think that uh, you guys have seen that it's quite, uh, we made sure to capture everything. This can be used for power performance tests. This can be used for lidars. This can be used for math mass. So it's 
quite impressive amount of work. And honestly, if I had tried to do this alone or just with my colleagues from RWE, I think we have failed. And I'm very happy that in the beginning, I took the path of uh, contributing and also trying to adopt the model. And the other theme here, which is the, the part of the time series and metadata applications, which is it's as um, simple and complex applications can be built on top of the data model. So once anyone who is working with uh, problems in big data or working with machine learning problems or working just uh, with a simple uh, time series forecasting and things like that knows that if you don't have structured data, you cannot do that in volume. You can do one application on your desktop, but if you want to scale that up, you just you cannot do it. So it was just a no brainer for us to go in that direction and contribute and implement. Um, now the our experience in implementing the data model. So the first piece, you know, we really concentrated with the lidars. I want to thank uh, uh, NRG Systems for allowing us to use the icon for the lidar. But we started with the lidars first because it has way less metadata than a math mass. So when Amit was presenting in the beginning, he kind of like showed the two paths and showed uh, like the math mass path and the and the remote sensing path. And I, I think the remote remote sensing path is much shorter. And by the way, this can also be used for uh, solders as well, not only for lighters. But for us it was like, okay, if we wanna if we wanna make sure that we won't fail implementing, let's start with the easy one. So we went with the lighters. The other one is the mobility of lighters. So as we have a big fleet, and if we want to make sure that we are managing the fleet in a right way and lighters move back and forth, you can have a lighter with a serial number A and replace with a serial number B on the same location. How do you make sure that you don't scramble your files on the back end? How you make sure that you combine them into a single measurement location? using all the, the definitions that we're using in task 43. So for us, it was also a way for us to tackle a problem of a fleeting, uh, of managing a fleet of devices. Uh, the third piece, which is very compelling for us to go, which I think that for the lighter manufacturers, uh, you know, it becomes much easier for people to implement the, the lighters into task 43 is that most of the metadata is packed in the time series files. So it greatly simplifies the implementation because it doesn't matter much if the installer said, I did this, I did that. Okay, well, if your PDF document uh, doesn't match your, you know, the, the, the document, I mean, the, the time series files, uh, you can easily see that because all you have to do is to parse those uh, time series files get your metadata and you don't have much left. Most of the information is packed there, not everything, but you get a lot of it. And finally, uh, easy automation of some of the LiDAR related tasks. There are some like really brainless stuff that you have to do it. For example, you have to convert from magnetic north to true north. Okay, why? you know, have someone typing those numbers if, you know, the meta, from the metadata, you can just do that. And with some lines of code, boom, done. So this is why we decided to go in that path uh, with uh, remote sensing devices. I think that so far, this workshop, we've talked a lot about math masks and, you know, uh, the, the braces of a math mass, the, the the boom direction and so on, but uh, this is completely uh, in change, uh, like we can easily use it this for uh, a remote sensing device and that's what we've done. Um, now the hour also of continuing with uh, the theme of the experience in implementing the data model. Uh, I'd say that the basic implementation is not complicated at all. But more you want to extract 
uh, the potential of the model, the more resources are necessary. So that's one of my takeaways. You can start very simple and uh, you will do simple things. But I also, my perspective is that more complicated you get, more cool stuff you can do with it. Uh, the other part is that the data validation is key. I think that here is it where things start, uh, when things start getting complicated. So uh, Stephen showed a little bit of the form that uh, uh, EDF, uh, one of the folks from EDF, Florian, worked uh, back in the time. I think that, that that form is a great way to start, actually. But uh, you have to be careful with what goes inside of it because of the validation piece. And for the LiDAR is, again, because of so much of the metadata is packed, there is not much of validation that you have to do. It's just in few points, so you can do that, uh, that implementation quickly. But I think that if you don't get, especially if you're talking about aut automation, especially if you're talking about using that information upstream in your, in your analysis, if you don't do the validation, you are in serious trouble, in my opinion. And that's where, again, things get more complicated. And lastly, uh, the participation of the industry players is really important to ensure a healthy code with wide functionality and usability. Uh, Stephen showed a little bit of like uh, the, the latest update. Uh, people keep uh, making uh, suggestions on how to change and how to improve. We keep working on it. Um, one that I just saw recently was uh, uncertainty for uh, the acquisition system for the loggers, which is something that was not present to like one of the releases. So we keep implementing and putting new things. And, uh, and I think that the model needs to have uh, people not only using, but also contributing to ensure that uh, we're doing, you know, keeping the great work. And finally, uh, a little bit of like the companies that we uh, know of that they are imp implementing or planning to implement the model. Uh, we actually know of more companies out there, uh, but we couldn't uh, get a hold of them. Or, uh, but these are some of the players, also uh, some of the, the the folks who really have put a lot of work uh, in building this data model uh, over more than one year. And uh, we have uh, owners and operators, developers, consultants, uh, wind tunnels, and uh, and um, sensor manufacturers. Uh, more people, other these are just the ones who we know who are implementing, but way more uh, companies have actually um, contributed to the data model as well. These are only the ones who have contributed. And that leads me to my last slide, which you, we can open for questions. Hey, Gibson, uh, Mike Purdue here from NRG. One thing which uh, I haven't heard anybody ask the question in the session, but I have heard it uh, externally before and I thought might be interesting. You know, you mentioned how we're, you and others have mentioned, we continue to evolve the data model. Clearly we saw, Stephen, Stephen showed us, it is versioned, right? We have releases and then another release and another. Uh, so I, I thought, you know, can you speak to um, how you or how anybody implementing this model might sort of keep pace with that change or manage through that um, and, and maybe talk about the version metadata that's included in the model as a means, one means of doing that? That's a good question. Um... We actually, we started the implementation with the very first version that went online. And for every single new update, uh, we just uh, update uh, uh, from the latest uh, JSON file, because I think that uh, the JSON is not following right now the SQL Postgres. But uh, the implementation, uh, once uh, it's been uh, put into like our internal implementation, is both in the SQL, but also uh, JSON format. So we can export a JSON format, for example. But we are basing ourselves from the latest uh, JSON uh, and just uh, adding the additional fields that are necessary uh, or tables that are necessary. So it's been very easy for us to do that uh, update uh, when a uh, new version comes out. And honestly, I don't know which version we are right now, but I think that uh, probably 
uh, I know we've done updates, but I don't know where we are at this moment. Okay, thank you. Some other questions out there? I guess I have a question for you, um, Curtis, uh, Gibson. This is Dave Carlson. Um, hey, I guess Dave. I haven't seen you since we were in a field somewhere in Oregon installing he, he, a, a LiDAR. Yeah. Back in the day. Um, yeah. Uh, around LiDAR, um, in when you're deploying a lidar i'm not sure how rwe does it but many uh owners will first deploy it against a met mast and do a, a validation slash calibration against a met mast how do you store that data or are you storing that uh, validation calibration data within the task 43 model or does that not fit at this time no the validation does not fit on that however I think that the, the model allows you to build the infrastructure that allows you to actually perform that task of that validation. So you can have uh, one measurement location for your LiDAR so, and one for your mat mast. And there you have all your, uh, you know, your data model for both. And uh, so what you need to do is to build an application on top of that in which you are getting, you know, for example, probably you want to do a correlation against your closest and the monitoring height to the closest height of your uh, LiDAR measurement. So you could easily loop and automate that. Um, we are not there yet. I think, we are, again, we're a lot of working on building the um, uh, infrastructure around uh, so we can do that. Uh, but it's in our roadmap to, you know, uh, do that sort of uh, uh, tools. And honestly, I think that if we can have tools like that open source available in the GitHub repository, if there are more people who want to tackle that sort of problem, then, you know, we could work together because I think that the validation against the mass is a such mundane thing that you need to do for remote sensing device that it's um it's it's necessary for everyone right so if uh if there is willingness in the industry for us to do an open source tool to do that then you know we work together and do it very cool thank you that that helps me to understand and it makes sense too because you have your plant which includes the lidar measurement location and the uh, reference mast measurement location and then you tie them together using that part of the model yeah. Any other questions for Gibson? Hi, Gibson. <clears throat> Thanks for the great presentation. Hey, man. Um, I know we have some OEM from LiDARs here. Do you have any thoughts having implemented the LiDAR system for RWE on what could like OEM or a, or a field deployment crew, what could they do that might help, let's say yourself or, you know, as, uh, or other developers in similar position? Yeah, I think that that's, yeah. That's an excellent question. And the way that I see is that we've spent a, a fair amount of time building parsers to parse the, both the time series and the metadata. And I think that uh, if uh, the, the sensor manufacturers in general, not only for LiDAR, but for any sort of like, you know, special loggers in that case, if they can make uh, parsers available um then uh, greatly simplifies the, the 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 task because a lot of the the time is is done 
uh, with uh, a lot of time was spent in, in building the parsers. And recently, actually, we realized that we had missed one of the 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 the, the fields, uh, and we had to uh, you know implement a new parser. And so we we're in the phase of like uh, trying to to get up to the speed on that part. So for me, that's that's key uh, in adoption. Uh, it will simplify everyone's lives. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, 